Okay, um, so welcome to the uh, Monday morning uh, lecture on uh, steel products. Um, at this stage, I would like to uh, remind you that we will uh, we'll, we are having quizzes every week on on Wednesday morning instead of exams and homeworks and things like this. Uh, the um, um, the material that I'll ask questions about will be in the slides that are now posted on the uh, I think E class uh, on the POVIS system. I don't know if you've looked at it already. There's considerable amount of material, right? So I think if you print it out, there's more than a thousand slides or something. So there's a massive amount of data there. Uh, it's, you know, lots of it is just for your information. Uh, there are many tables in there that you can use as reference after the course. Of course, we will not discuss every uh, standard that there is. Hmm? Um, so don't be uh, frightened too much by the number of slides. Um, in addition, there's lots of photographic examples, which obviously uh, are just there for your, um, uh, as illustrate, to illustrate things. Um, so again, the exams, the, the quiz, excuse me, on, uh, on the Wednesdays will be you know, very simple, 10 questions, either yes or no answers or multiple choice, so we can go through them very quickly. Um, uh, I would like to know now, uh, of course, you can t always change your, uh, uh, whether or not you register for the course, uh, how, many, how many people are actually taking the course? So that is one, two, three, four. Okay, so I have an idea of how many copies, uh, uh, pages I have to print out on Wednesday. Um, right. Uh, well, it's what I wanted to say, I guess, at this point. Um, so let's um, quickly continue with the, um, uh, the, the making of steels, right? And, uh, and as I said last week, it's really important to realize that uh, you, you make this steel composition in the liquid phase. So, and basically, it's done during the, uh, what we call the secondary metallurgy. Um, and we had just um, been talking about uh, how you can, uh, for certain grades that require it, uh, go down to extremely low levels of uh, carbon and nitrogen uh, by using what is called vacuum metallurgy. And the, I don't know, I had already told you that most of the uh, technologies today we're using these, what's called these RH degassers, which are these big t vacuum tanks that you put over the uh, secondary metallurgy ladle here, and you circulate the, the, the liquid metal uh, between the ladle and this, this vacuum, vacuum chamber here. And uh, by adding some uh, uh, oxygen, you are able to uh, remove carbon and oxygen uh, that are in solution to very low levels. Mm -hmm. And in addition, you can also make uh, alloying additions at this level. It's very convenient if you have a machine that can do this uh, because the, the, loss, the loss of alloying elements is, uh, is, is minimal. Mm -hmm. So this process, although uh, you're mainly removing uh, carbon and oxygen in solution, we call it degassing, yes? And uh, so this is the, de the degassing. Um, in, uh, in this process, you, you get extremely low levels of, of carbon. Uh, ten, so this is 0 0.001 weight percent. So, uh, uh, weight percent Sh should correctly, more correctly, it should be mass percent. So 
I very often use the word mass percent rather than weight percent. Uh, the reason being that uh, weight is a force and mass is kilograms and, and this is what is meant here. So it should be mass percent. Uh, okay, so uh, this is 10 times 10 to the minus four, yes? And, and, uh, so in, in that's percentage, right? So this is, this is the same as 10 weight or mass PPMs, okay? So uh, I, I kind of, when the concentrations get very low, uh, we tend to use PPMs rather than weight percents. Uh, and this is the relation uh, 10 to the minus four, okay. uh, excuse me, uh, 10 to the, one times 10 to the minus four uh, percent is one uh, PPM. Uh, right, good. So uh, basically you can get uh, your carbon levels very, very low, your nitrogen levels very low, and also um, elements such as hydrogen are very, very, very low contents. Hmm? Um, and that is quite an achievement because you are, uh, this is done uh, on a standard basis, um, on, a, on a daily basis. And, and these levels of carbon and nitrogen are extremely low. They're, they're actually e even very difficult to reach in laboratory levels. So uh, this is quite, this technology is quite an, an achievement. Hmm? Um, I also want to say uh, that uh, you also add some uh, lime to this uh, uh, system. And the reason is to remove inclusions, yes? And um, inclusions, you, it, are basically micron size oxides. Hmm? And um, uh, you remember that uh, we add uh, aluminum to our molten steel to, uh, to kill it. As you remember, if we don't add aluminum, we get uh, CO uh, bubbles, yes? And the steel becomes effervescent and you cannot cast it in a continuous cast. So, um, as a consequence of the addition of aluminum, you get uh, oxides. But there are other uh, particles, uh, large particles that you have in the steel, which you can, uh, which are difficult to avoid. And uh, experience, uh, uh, from experience, we know that you have sulfides and then oxides, and the oxides are called oxides, which they're typically aluminum oxides, rich. Uh, we have silicates, yes. Uh, and, and then we have globular, ill-defined oxides, huh? okay, which contain uh, aluminum, calcium, and magnesium. And they, they have a name, you know, if you, if you work in uh, steel uh, plants, they will call them type A, type B, type C, and type D, right? This, this, uh, uh, well-known nomenclature. Uh, now, um, obviously, you you know that silicates uh, are oxides, yes, uh, just like aluminum oxide. The type D, I also told you they're oxides. So why uh, do we have um, uh, larger particles which are sulfides? You know, where do these come from? Do these come from? Well, you know, we always have sulfur in uh, in, in uh, steel, yeah, in the liquid steel. Again, where does it come from? It comes from the ore and ends up partly in, in the steel. Now, if you uh, uh, wouldn't have any magne uh, manganese, MN, in your steel, you would form the, uh, the solubility of sulfur in liquid steel is limited. So as you decrease the temperature, you would form uh, iron sulfides. And these iron sulfides are low melting compounds. Yes, so, um, and that would give you, uh, and the low melting compounds will tend to uh, accumulate at drain boundaries and you'd have basically cracking of the material. The material would crack anytime you would apply a stress on it. The, the grains where the sulfide is present would open up and you'd have cracking. So, this type of uh, hot cracking 
uh, is usually taken care of by forming a non, uh, by forming a solid sulfide, and that's manganese sulfide. So we, that's one of the reasons why you, uh, uh, manganese is in the steel. There are many other reasons why role that manganese can play in steel, but uh, as far as the, uh, the, the steel making and the casting is uh, um, concerned, the manganese is, is added to uh, avoid the formation of iron sulfide. So, and that's why you get these type A uh, inclusions. What is also very important about these inclusions is their shape and their mechanical properties. So uh, type A inclusions can be deformed, they're deformable, yes? The uh, type B inclusions are, they tend to break and they're very angular and very hard particles. Um, and we don't like that very much, yes? So um, uh, usually the, their uh, shape and properties are improved by adding calcium to the, uh, to the metal. Type C are manganese silicates, they're plastic, they can also deform plastically. And then you have the globular particles, which, which do not have a very big negative impact. One of the reasons because there are not many of them in general. However, um, whatever you do, you'd rather have as low a volume fraction of particles of inclusions as possible. Yes, and so that is one of the reason why the stirring the melt during the uh, degassing is so important, yes? And that's why, um, uh, for instance, you have the alternative system to the, uh, the, the uh, RH degasser is a, a tank degasser. It's basically a big pot that's under vacuum. You put it under vacuum. And uh, even there, you bubble argon through the bottom here, yes, so that the, uh, the inclusions are carried along with these bubbles to the slag here, to the slag. Hmm? And um, these, uh, and then they're caught up in the slag, incorporated in the slag and removed from the melt. So it's very important that you um, uh, have this uh, movement of the uh, melt because if you look at the diameter of these typical uh, oxide uh, inclusions, you see that if they're large particles, like uh, about 1,000 microns, a big millimeter large particles, um, they will move, they have a lower, um, because they're oxide, they're light, they're lighter, uh, they're lower density than the steel, they will naturally uh, move to the top of the melt, yes? Uh, but the velocity will depend on their size because as they move up, uh, there are frictional forces that work on this uh, oxide particle. Huh? So, um, so the, uh, if, if you look at a thousand micron uh, particle, in 20 minutes time, it can move a, a, a big distance, yes? However, um, you're also interested in removing tiny particles, like uh, 20 micron and smaller particles, and there, it takes uh, three hours for a tiny particle to move about uh, three meters. And uh, these tank degassers and degassers in general, they, uh, they're about, they're meter sized, right? So um, it's essential to have a, a flow of the, of the metal in the degassers to make sure you remove as many inclusions as possible, as possible. I have to do it this way, it doesn't want to. Okay. So once you have uh, set the, the heat, you have uh, set the uh, composition, you're ready to, to do the caster, the ca to go to the caster and do the casting. Most of the casting nowadays is, is done in continuous casting so what you basically have is you have a turret with two ladles, yeah? <coughs> uh, you need to have continuously liquid 
uh, material available. So that's why you have two, a turret with two ladles so you can instantly change from an empty ladle to a full ladle yeah, uh, and feed uh, the uh, liquid metal to a ton dish. Hmm? We'll see in a moment what the ton dish does. It uh, basically provides um, uh, the liquid metal to an oscillating mold. And the oscillating mold is a copper mold, has a special shape, and, um, but it's basically a water-cooled, bottomless, no bottom, uh, uh, mold uh, that in which the, uh, the liquid metal will solidify. Yeah? It doesn't solidify 100%, only the surface layer solidifies. And uh, as soon as this layer is uh, solidified, layer has formed, you move it down, yes, uh, uh, through the oscillations of the mold. So the mold moves up and down, uh, and uh, you grow, you basically grow a, um, a endless uh, uh, string of uh, material. Hmm? Uh, obviously, because it's endless, you have to uh, somehow uh, uh, cut end pieces of it once it's uh, solidified. Uh, so most of the um, uh, continuous casters have a, a bend in them, yes, with a lot of uh, support and bending rolls. And, and of course, you have to continue con cooling the material because it only gradually uh, solidifies. Hmm? And so there's liquid metal inside uh, the uh, the string of material. Um, so in the continuous casting, um, in particular in the, the, the uh, tundish and the mold, you have to keep the steel uh, clean. You have to avoid segregations uh, it, during the casting. You also have to avoid reoxidation hmm, and resulfurization. Hmm? Okay. So this is how uh, the equipment, industrial equipment, looks like. Here you have the, the turret with two ladles. Uh, it's very difficult to see the, the actual tundish uh, is here. Also, the oscillating mole is below this platform, so you can't really see it. And the, uh, the rolls and the curve in the caster is here. And here you can see the, uh, the slab coming out. And uh, the slab is then cut in about 10 meter long pieces. Uh, by a torch cutter. Hmm? So the ladle uh, provides via this uh, uh, nozzle material, liquid material to a ton dish. That's a flat uh, bucket basically where you have uh, the uh, molten material. Yeah? Um, you have here uh, a dam and a filter to avoid too much turbulence in the uh, in the ton dish, and then you have various types of uh, entry tubes. Yeah, so you can have uh, uh, you even have very simple uh, tubes, which are basically holes in the bottom of the ton dish, uh, which you cannot uh, uh, open or close. They just pour the metal directly in the copper mold. This is an example here. Yeah. Uh, or you have more sophisticated uh, uh, systems where you have nozzles, so where you can switch on and off and control the flow uh, through the nozzles here. Mm, there's a lot of technology involved here. So you, here you can see the, the tundra, and here you see uh, this platform here is actually the oscillating mold, and, and here you can see that this type of what we call metering nozzle that directly pours metal into the, uh, the mold, the oscillating mold. Okay, so if, if you look into more detail, um, the, uh, this is the, the mold, the liquid, where you pour in the, the material. So it's, the material comes out of the nozzle here, yes. Uh, it flows sideways. So it flows towards the uh, copper mold. It solidifies. You form a solidified shell. Yes, mm -hmm. and uh, okay, solidified shell. It's protected by 
usually a powder, yeah, it's you know, a powder, which we call flux powder, casting flux powder, yes, which work as a lubricant between the uh, solidifying uh, surface and the and the mold surface, so that, so that it doesn't stick. Yeah. Now there, you can already see that there is plenty of opportunities to uh, get uh, defects in uh, in the surface. So obviously, uh, there is liquid metal here. There's a, a thin uh, uh, solidified surface here. So there will be a very strong, heavy, what we call ferrostatic pressure uh, on the surface. So the, the surface will bulge out literally between the, the rolls, the support rolls. It's very important to keep it cold, yes, and, uh, and stabilize. Yeah? Um, also, whenever you will make a, a bend in the, uh, in the slab, you will have tensile forces working on the uh, solidified surface, yes, uh, in addition to this ferrostatic pressure, right? So, so it's really important to uh, make sure that any brittleness hmm, uh, is avoided at high temperature. Because don't forget, this is, this is at very high temperatures. We're talking here about, uh, at the start of the solidification, we're talking about uh, 1600 degrees C, yes? Uh, at, um, so, so liquid, uh, liquid steel is about 1550, right? That's the melting temperature. So this is, this is barely below that. So this, this uh, skin, this solidified skin of steel is very, very, is not a strong metal, right? It has uh, much less than uh, 100 megapascal of strength, right? So it will very easily uh, break, okay? Um, there are many things, this is, um, I will not go into this, but there are many things that, uh, that have an impact on uh, steel design, which, are, uh, which result from the use of continuous casting. One of them uh, is the fact that in these, uh, for instance, in particular in this submerged uh, nozzle, this is industry standard nowadays is very few places where you pour the liquid steel directly in the uh, mold yeah you can have uh, inside this uh, nozzle you can have clogging yes some compounds uh, have uh, st stopped being soluble at relatively high temperatures uh, titanium compounds are like this Aluminum compounds are like this. So if you have steel compositions which are too rich in titanium, too rich in aluminum, they will clog the, uh, the nozzles and that, that will have an impact on the, uh, the flow through the nozzle. Hmm? In, uh, it can be very bad. It can even block the nozzle, yes? And or, or in the best cases and uh, in the worst cases, the, the, the nozzle can be fully blocked. You can have instability in the flow of the metal, etc. Hmm? So, um, so that is why uh, you know when you design new steels, you also should uh, think about what's going to be the impact of that steel on the processing, hmm? and in particular, very highly alloyed uh, steels are difficult to cast. Yeah? It doesn't mean that they're that you cannot cast them. It just means, for instance, you have clogging, you have inclusions, you have problems with strength at high temperatures, etc. Hmm? So these are elements you always have to take into account when processing steel. Um, one of the things that um, uh, uh, helped the development of continuous casting is the quality of the steel, in particular the internal structure much is much more homogeneous is uh, chemically and also microstructurally yeah? uh, when you cast you probably uh, from uh, introductory courses in material science you know that when you cast a metal or anything you have what's called 
very often dendritic growth, yes? And this dendritic growth gives rise to uh, very large crystals, dendrites, yes? Um, which has generally poor properties. Uh, and then in between the dendrites you get uh, as a consequence of partitioning of elements between solid and liquid, you get very different compositions locally. Yeah? So in order to avoid this, uh, you can avoid a lot of it uh, in uh, continuous casting mm, because the uh, cooling speeds are more important, yes? And uh, so the nucleation rates are higher, etc. cetera. But um, even then, you still have uh, uh, the risk of dendritic growth that can be addressed by having um, electromagnetic stirring. That means, so if this is the uh, the nozzle here that we just had, yes, where, and, and this is the uh, copper mold, and here you have the liquid metal. What you do, what people do, is they will add uh, induction coil here so that the, the metal is, as long as it's uh, liquid, it is in motion. It, it, uh, it flows um, inside the, uh, inside the uh, shell, the, the solid shell. And so this motion uh, improves, uh, uh, reduces segregation, yes. Um, it also uh, reduces temperature differences, yes, and uh, casting microstructures. And I can show you an example here. This is a billet, this continuous cast billet. On this side, you can see this feathery pattern, which are, due, which are basically dendrites. And if you cast with a electromagnetic stirrer, you can also have a, uh, you, you can have a very homogeneous distribution of the um, microstructure with minimum uh, dendrite uh, formation. These mold stirrers are placed, can be placed in many places in the in casting to, to optimize uh, product quality. Mm -hmm. And this is what is called internal quality, yes? Uh, so minimizing uh, structural and compositional differences across the material. Mm -hmm. um, I also want to, uh, just this is just a thing on the side. These uh, uh, powder fluxes mm -hmm. um, uh, insulate uh, the uh, metal from oxygen mm -hmm. and they also avoid temperature losses. So th they're very important. Uh, elements in the uh, in keeping the composition of the steel unaffected by the the surroundings yes um, and I just wanted to mention a typical uh, casting powder composition here yeah? um, because it contains fluorides and sodium uh, uh, oxide the um, very often uh, some of you may end up in uh, quality departments or having to look at uh, uh, technological problems once in a while. Uh, very often uh, you can track, uh, very often you, you'll have problems which are related to inclusions and mysterious uh, surface defects. Um, the presence of uh, sodium and fluor, fluor uh, in, a, in a defect points to the uh, continuous casting mold powder, right? That's an important thing to know that, uh, that that's where uh, that inclusion got trapped into uh, the material somehow and gave rise eventually to um, a, a, a surface problem, a surface defect, yeah? So this, if you see sodium or flu fluorine in a uh, in a defect, it's not related to steel making, right? Or iron making, yes? Because these slags do not contain these compounds. Good, what, let's have a look at what, uh, what can go wrong when you cast. Well, one of the things is uh, 
cracking. Cracking is a, a major uh, headache for uh, steel makers uh, in terms of quality. And uh, in particular, what we call peritactic steels. Uh, so again, I, I assume that you're familiar with phase diagrams because I'm not discussing phase diagrams in this course or, or uh, assume you, you have this working knowledge of phase diagrams. So what does this mean? Well, if you look at the high temperature uh, solidification uh, of, of carbon steels, so you look at the, just look at the, uh, at this side of our diagram, you see that um, around 1500 degrees C, during solidification, you get a peritactic reaction. And, and so, and you can see that, so the, uh, the, uh, the first phase, solid phase one is a delta phase, yes? And then you get a, uh, a reaction where the uh, liquid, yes, remain liquid, when you get the final solidification, goes, becomes gamma plus delta, yeah? Now the interesting thing is that this, uh, this, uh, the first solidification, this is the formation of delta from liquid to liquid plus delta, gives rise to a contraction, a volume change, and uh, there is a second contraction when the remaining liquid uh, transforms to gamma, solid gamma plus solid delta. So there's contraction, right? So you can imagine you have a big piece of material, yes, it's solidifying and it's contracting, yes, twice. Right? So, uh, right, so that, that this thermal contraction will give us tensile stresses, yes? And, and, sur and, and surface cracks if uh, these uh, thermal stresses are too important. No? So and you can see here, so you can do the measurement of this thermal contraction at lower and lower temperature and you see how uh, more important the thermal contraction becomes. And so it's, it's, it doesn't come as a surprise then that if you look at surface defects, in particular, uh, the depth of what we call oscillation marks, yes, and you see that uh, the depth of these marks is very high for certain carbon contents. And, and why is the carbon content important? Well, because whether or not you get these contractions depends on whether or not you get a peritactic reaction, right? So you see the peritactic reaction occurs for carbon contents that are less than 0.2%. And that's a vast number of steels. Yeah? So they're very sensitive to this uh, problem. So you also get a lot of surface cracks uh, can occur. Um, so that this is one of the things uh, we have to be careful of uh, is casting of peritactic steels uh, in order to avoid surface defects, uh, in particular surface cracks. It's not the only thing. There is a risk for uh, cracking uh, because of the solidification. There is also a risk for cracking, um, and that is then called hot cracking. That there is also a risk for cracking once you have formed 100% uh, uh, solid uh, material. In particular, you can see here uh, on this uh, micrograph, you see indicated by uh, these red arrows are these cracks in the material. What are they? Well, if you study them, what you see is you see grain boundaries, and along these grain boundaries, you see films of uh, precipitates, which are uh, very often carbides or nitrides. Yeah? And um, you can do clever experiments in the laboratory. Mm? You can take a mat uh, uh, material mm? of a composition that you think is very sensitive to uh, hot cracking, you heat the material to casting, cast continuous cast temperature, and you pull, you just do a, a, a deformation uh, of the material. Uh, and if you use a cylindrical rod to do this, yes, uh, what you will observe is that in general, at high temperature, material is extremely ductile. Yeah? But then you come at a temperature range 
where this ductility suddenly disappears. And your material just breaks like this. Hmm? So if you use what we call the reduction of area, reduction of area, as a uh, measure for the uh, ductility, <coughs> so you see here the reduction of area will be very high, yeah, and can be close to 100 percent. You know the, the amount of constriction is very can be very high. Here it, the reduction of area is uh, close to zero or very low. Hmm? So let's have a look at the graph I, I'm showing. So here you see the ductility uh, as a function of the temperature, and you see that. For certain steels, yeah, composition, you have a huge ductility gap. Yeah? The ductility is 100% yeah, to 30%. Right? So very, that means that uh, you bend the material, you pull at it in a uh, very small amount, and it just cracks. Yeah? And the reason is because, again, um, uh, these carbides uh, of the alloying element you've added yeah, uh, to the steel will uh, weaken the boundaries of uh, at high temperature again. Yes? So these are all things that need to be considered when you, know, you think about uh, making a steel and processing a steel. Yeah. It's, you've got to know, is there a ductility gap? And if there is a ductility gap, at what temperature does it occur? And so the trick is, of course, is to avoid this ductility gap. Yeah. Obviously, when you're cooling down something, uh, you have to go through the ductility gap. So the, 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 the idea is to go through this as quick as possible, right? Yes. Don't give the carbides uh, the chance to form or grow. Yes? That's so avoid doing too much with the material at 850. <laughs> That's the message, right? Obviously, you, when you're cooling, you can't av avoid going through that temperature range. Right? Okay. Good. So, if you've managed, uh, by the way, uh, uh, you can have uh, big disasters in a steel plant. It's when the slab actually breaks and it's still partially liquid. You can imagine that you, you have the liquid metal uh, flows out of the uh, the caster, uh, and of course it's liquid metal, so it's, as soon as it solidifies, it's welded your entire caster to, all the parts are welded, and uh, so it's a, it's, it's a big disaster when that happens. Yeah? So, uh, so th don't take these things lightly, right? Because you don't want, you know, you don't, you don't want cracks because that gives you surface defect, but you also don't want you know, it's uh, cracking in the, uh, of the, uh, in, during casting. So the, uh, very important things. Uh, so, so always listen to your colleagues in the steel plant, you know, from their feedback when you, when you have brilliant ideas of, for new steels. Hmm? Okay, so the, uh, the material that you finally get is a flat slab. Not necessarily a slab. We'll, we'll, you, know, you can have billets or, or blooms. We'll, we'll talk about those also. But uh, they're about 10 meters long, 25 centimeters in uh, thickness, and across. So the the, 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 uh, the dimensions in the in the width, you know, that basically varies on uh, the um, the cast the size of the caster. Yes. Um, and can be anywhere from a meter to close to two meters. And you'd say, well, you know, that's not so important, but it is actually extremely important because it determines uh, the dimensions of the material. The and if you're going to make sheet material for automotive applications, for instance, I don't know if you own a car, but the side, the side of a car the exterior part of is very, very wide, yes? And uh, car makers like this because, you know, that you give them a very wide uh, sheet of material because they can make this part in one go, in one pressing, yes? And, of course, uh, this, is, this is the moment in the caster 
where you decide the width, basically the width of a sheet product. Yeah? We'll see that there are tracks uh, to, uh, to, to change the width of a slab yes, within a certain range, but they're very costly, very costly uh, technical solutions. But this is uh, basically the moment where you set uh, for sheet products the width of your product. So what happens afterwards, and we'll go into more detail uh, uh, in this as, as we go along, so I'm not, you uh, basically, uh, if you're processing sheet products, uh, this is the route, but you get very similar uh, processing for other types of products. So you reheat the material in a reheating furnace. You uh, start with a, a general roughing uh, to obtain starting dimensions. You, you go through a finishing mill, some kind of finishing where you get the final thickness. And then you go through what's called the runout table. It basically looks like a, a, cooling, a cooling device. However, it's a very important cooling device because that's where you get all the transformations, the phase transformations occur. So up to here, you can basically assume that you do all the processing in the, aust of, in the austenitic range, in homogeneous austenitic range. After the runout table, you get the room temperature microstructure, hmm? uh, which you coil. It, one of the things that happens with continuously cast products, yes, is that they end up being extremely long, right? Not just a little bit longer than the original uh, slab, but much longer than the original slab. So let's calculate how much, uh, how, mu you know, how much longer, yes? So if you start uh, with a slab that's 25 uh, centimeters in, in thickness, yes? And uh, this, the roughing stage, in the roughing stage, roughing mill, yes? Um, you will usually go from this 25 centimeters to 25 millimeters, yeah? So you go to 25 millimeters, 25 millimeters, yeah? So that's basically tenfold reduction, yeah? Tenfold reduction. Uh, rolling is a, what we call a plain strain deformation, right? So there is no width change. So it's gonna mean that if you make it uh, 10 times uh, thinner, it becomes 10 times longer, right? So something that's uh, uh, t uh, t 10 meters becomes 100 meters, yes? And during the finishing mill, uh, you go down uh, typically, obviously there are variations, but if you want a typical number, a few millimeters. So let's say a number that's not too bad is five millimeters, five, six millimeters. Uh, so that means uh, that you go from 100 meters now to, and I can't even draw this here, yeah, to 500 meters. Yes, half a kilometer, yes? So, um, in addition, yes, uh, you have the speed at which things happen increases a lot, yes? If, if, if this moves at a certain speed, yes, and this has to move at a certain speed, yes, and this to keep temperatures constant, deformation, um, uh, the amount of deformations um, uh, has to be, uh, uh, let me say it differently, the mass flow through the equipment has to be the same. Hmm? So, see if you have a steel plant, what comes in must go out. If it doesn't, like, if you have more coming in than coming out, you obviously you'll be accumulating steel, yeah? Uh, so, um, so what comes in is basically velocity times time, and what comes out is also velocity times time. Hmm? 
velocity times the time will give you. So um, you will basically get a, a large increase in velocity of this. Yeah? So this, this thing will move much faster through the line than the, this, this slab goes, right? So, uh, and, um, so that means there'll be lots of challenges to get the transformation right, uh, the temperatures right, et cetera. Yes? And uh, so we'll, we'll see this in more detail. But basically, um, if, you, uh, if you want to look at things a bit simply, uh, you go from 12 to 1300 degrees C in the reheating down to when you, you end up here in the range of uh, 550 to 780 degrees C. And there is a, a, a temperature uh, decrease that's uh, relatively uh, small as you, uh, in terms of the, the, the cooling rate, up to the end of the finishing. This is all austenitic, and then you cool down to get your transformation, your microstructure. Okay, so this brings us to the the the, the microstructure. Okay, so uh, what what are we talking about uh, in uh, with microstructures? It's always um, uh, a problem of um, the the scale, right? Uh, obviously, when we talk about industrial processes, big industrial processes, we talk about the micro, macro scale. So we talk about meters, size objects, centimeter sized objects. So um, things that we can see with eyes or with cameras. Hmm? Okay. Uh, the microstructure goes from what's called the meso scale. Yeah, that's sub Submillimeter scale, yeah, micron scale, yes. And to observe this uh, in the correct way, you need you would need at least an optical microscope. And very often today, if we want to say anything uh, that makes a difference or that's valuable uh, in both research and steel technology, you need to use. Uh, have a better knowledge of what's happening at the Submicron scale down to the nanoscale. Mm? And so we're going from the nanos, from the mesoscale to the atomistic scale. Mm? And for these, you need electron microscopes typically to see things such as what, what we see here, uh, dislocations. Or nowadays, we're, you know, uh, we're blessed with uh, high resolution microscopes. So you can even go and look into uh, your steel at the, uh, at the atomic level. Mm? So this is, for instance, the uh, iron lattice uh, for ferrite resolved by a, an electron microscope. Yeah. And you're very fortunate because at, at, uh, on the Postec campus there's lots of equipment that allows you to look at these materials. Yeah. So, the, um, so this uh, the steel we're looking at in terms of material, what, what kind of a definition could we give to it in terms of structure. Well, uh, well we're all familiar with um, quartz crystals, yes? We know that uh, this uh, uh, very um, crystalline microstructure is, is due to the internal uh, structure of the atoms. Mm? This, this is an example that's very microscopic. This is a small magnesium oxide single crystal. So in both for this quartz and this magnesium oxide, you see this very crystallographic appearance, right? When you, when you look at a steel microstructure, it's much more difficult to see this, the underlying crystal structure. Mm -hmm. Now this is for instance an example here. Uh, it's a um, very fine microstructure, but I don't see any uh, crystal phases, I don't see, uh, but it's as crystalline as this quartz and magnesium oxide, right? So, so the same uh, uh, structure. So every uh, lath here is actually a single crystal of iron, yeah? Uh, it may not look like one, but it, it is one. Hmm? So that means that if we go down to the atomic level, 
we have crystal structure uh, for iron and its alloys and that has translational symmetry with symmetry axes, with symmetry planes, with other more complex symmetries and we have something that we call a unit cell, yes, which allows us to, to simplify uh, this, this 3D uh, structure, crystal structure, uh, to collapse it into one single unit. Hmm? Uh, so what happens in our steel? Well, in our steel, we have, for instance, you take uh, just plain uh, polycrystalline iron sample. Uh, that's the unit cell of this uh, BCC iron at room temperature. And uh, our uh, steel is basically consists of an agglomeration of little crystals, yes, where the unit cell has different orientations. Yeah? And uh, that's why we see grain boundaries, because grain boundaries are places where you have uh, this registry between the two lattices. Yeah? Uh, obviously, uh, the degree of misorientation can vary. Yeah? For instance, here I have a random set of uh, these little unit cells are turned in all kinds of different directions. I can have texture. That means where these unit cells are not exactly perfectly parallel, but a little bit misoriented with respect to each other. Hmm? That we call texturing, crystallographic texture. Yes? And that's very important in for many steel products because processing very often gives rise to pronounced texturing. Yeah? In certain cases, uh, the texturing is actually used to get specific properties. Yeah? And then we'll see an example uh, in the case of uh, many sheet products. Uh, we try to have extreme texturing of the uh, sheet to get the best possible formability. Uh, we'll see later on, not at the early stage of the course, but later stage in the course, we'll talk about electrical steels, and there we'll see that uh, we also have extremes of uh, texture to achieve magnetic properties. Hmm? Okay, so texture and uh, processing is, uh, is important. Hmm? You also know that uh, there are two so-called allotropic forms of um, iron, so there, the iron is a polymorphic substance. You have a low temperature PCC uh, structure and a high temperature FCC structure. And this is their unit cells. Um, why they exist yes, is a long story. Yeah? And I'm not going to talk about this, but, you know, this, uh, but it's basically there is a magnetic reason why we have these two phases. And the only reason why, in particular, ferrite is stable at room temperature, it's, it's because it's ferromagnetic, okay? But I won't talk too much about this, um, as I'm sure it, it's covered in, in other courses, and we're really talking about products. One of the things I do want to say about the, uh, these two uh, unit cells. So if, let's have a look at the unit cell for BCC. It has a lattice parameter of about... 0.289, let's write it down, 0.289, did I write it, yeah. That's the lattice parameter for ferrite, and the lattice parameter for austenite is 0.363, okay? So, and you know that, uh, or if you don't know, I, I will tell you now, that the temperature at which this austenite transforms to ferrite is depending on who you're reading, 910, 912. It doesn't really matter to us if you work on steels because it's composition dependent. So you would have to measure it for your own steel, right? So, um, but, but the importance is, the important thing I want to uh, tell you, ask you is, now, if you go from 
austenite to ferrite. What happens? And, um, and, what's imp and why is it important technologically? Well, f two things happen. Uh, first of all, when you go from austenite to ferrite, you release heat. Yeah? The heat of transformation. Right? So there will be a considerable amount of heat will be released. And we'll see that that has an impact in technology because that means you, if you want to cool steel uh, and it, as it transforms, you will have to provide the cooling powder, power, yeah? enough cooling power to, uh, to achieve the cooling rate that you want. Hmm? Okay. There's another thing that's in interesting is that if I were to ask you what happens, they have different lattice constants, right? Like this one is a larger lattice, la larger unit cell than this one. So what happens, something must change to the size of the material as you go from a small, from a large to small unit cell. And that's right, you have a volume change. So the, yes, and we use this all the time um, to actually track the transformation by a technique that's called dilatometry. Yeah? But what is more interesting is the volume change, I want to uh, let you know, is when you go from austenite to ferrite, you would think that on the basis of the lattice constants, you would have a contraction. It's not a contraction. Hmm? The reason why is that because in this unit cell, there are two iron atoms. In this unit cell, there are four iron atoms, yes? So what you have to look at is the specific volume, yeah? the, the, the volume, the volume per atom, the specific volume of alpha and the specific volume of gamma. So that's, that's the volume per atom iron, yes? The specific volume is like this. The specific volume of uh, ferrite is larger than, so when you go from austenite to ferrite, there is an expansion of the, of the volume. Hmm? The unit cell is smaller, but who cares? That's not, that's not what determines the volume of your, uh, the volume per iron atom. Hmm? Hmm? So expansion. Hmm? Okay. Is this transformation, is this change from one lattice to the other, is that an instantaneous thing? No, it isn't. It takes time, yes. And the time it takes to transform, to go from austenite to ferrite, well, is temperature dependent, yes. And uh, of course, we all know that. Uh, and uh, uh, that is the reason why uh, when we discuss steel products, uh, we will be talking at about transformation time temperature diagrams and continuous transformation time diagrams. Hmm? What it basically means is that when you go from austenite to ferrite, yes, the transformation is not instantaneous, but you have to study it via a temperature time diagram, which tells you how the fast the transformation goes. For instance, in a hot strip mill, hmm, of which I just showed you a, a schematic a few slides ago, the temperature goes down, yes, as we cool the material, uh, yeah, and then you hit a temperature, yes, at which the transformation begins, yes, transformation begins. See? And it's, if you have a simple, very simple steel, you basically start by making, you transform austenite to ferrite, yes? And uh, your cooling, when it's finished, goes into, you, you coil the material, yes? And you have a much lower cooling rates, yes? So the transformation will, to ferrite will continue up to this time, yeah? At this time, another transformation will set in, that's the, 
the perlite transformation in this particular case. Yeah. Right. Obviously, that does not occur if you have pure iron. Yes. But so the uh, the, the transformation is uh, is not instantaneous, and it takes time, and it dep the time it takes depends on the temperature, and this type of transformation is called uh, a uh, diffusional a diffusional transformation or a nucleation and growth transformation. Come back to that in a moment. Yeah? Now, uh, obviously, as I already uh, mentioned, we don't have uh, pure iron, but we have alloys. Uh, steels are alloys, so, um, and we broadly talk about interstitial elements and substitutional elements. And the interstitial elements are typically the most important one we already talked about is carbon, nitrogen, boron, oxygen are interstitial elements. Although I have to say that boron can be both interstitial and substitutional elements. It's, it's, it's a rather exceptional uh, behavior. Um, and the uh, interstitial elements, it, we know from uh, a lot of uh, experiments that uh, the nitrogen and carbon are always located in what we call octahedral interstices in both uh, ferrite and austenite. Mm -hmm. So that means octahedral interstices is the center of this type of octahedra described by six atoms. Yes, anytime you can find an octahedra like this is just one of them, one of the many, yes, that the carbon atom sits in the middle of this. And here is an octahedra. There's an octahedra right in the smack in the center of the unit cell. In the case of the FCC, that's where the carbon atoms will be located. Yeah? Now there is, again, a big difference between austenite and ferrite. Yes? When we look at the unit cell, we see that the space available for carbon atom, yes, here, is, uh, so this is the, the diameter of the space that's available for the carbon atom in the ferrite. It's very small. And the, uh, this, the same space in the octahedral interstices in the gamma or austenite is about three, between two and three times larger. This has a very big consequence. It basically means that there is room, structurally room, in the lattice of austenite to accommodate interstitials. There is no room in the ferrite lattice to accommodate interstitials. So, where at, and this explains why the solubility of carbon and nitrogen is very high in austenite, but is in principle, certainly at room temperature, close to zero for ferrite. Yes? This is also an important point and will, will comes back a lot, uh, many times in uh, steel physical metallurgy, is the fact that once you go from austenite to ferrite, not only do you get a volume change, there is, you may heat, the heat of transformation, you also, you know, if there is uh, carbon in the austenite, suddenly the carbon will find itself in a new lattice where it's not welcome or not soluble, where there's no room, and so the carbon will have a tendency to form um, yeah, um, carbides, which we'll talk about in a moment. So, um, uh, one of the things it can do uh, for a limited, uh, uh, within a limited range, uh, the, this carbon atom is it, it distorts the the lattice. So if you put carbon in here, yes, in this octahedron here in BCC, if I put the carbon, these this octahedron doesn't stay the way it used to be. It's it distorts the lattice locally. 
So, so the, this distance should be equal to the lattice parameters, about 0.29 nanometer, right? This is about this, yes? When you have a carbon atom, locally it will distort the, this uh, octahedron, and so it will increase this distance to a value larger than 0.29 nanometer, and it will decrease this distance, yes? So the pretty considerable distortion. Why do I mention this? Because we will see that uh, the, the presence of atoms in steel has an influence on the, uh, the strength of the steel. And one of the reasons is because the atoms that we add to steel distort the lattice elastically, hmm? which is a, an important uh, elastic deformation that, ha that has impact on uh, mechanical properties which we will discuss uh, as we go. The other type of elements that uh, we have in steels are uh, substitutional elements, yes? Um, and uh, so they're just sitting in the lattice where normally an iron atom would be, so they substitute iron atoms. Uh, they also influence the lattice locally. Uh, they can uh, result in lattice expansion. If you add chrome, manganese, molybdenum, the lattice will expand. Uh, they can re uh, lead to lattice contraction, hmm? silicon or aluminum. Uh, the alloying also influences the stability, thermodynamic stability of the austenite and the ferrite and will also have an impact on the kinetics of the transformation. How fast does the transformation go? Hmm? Uh, there are certain atoms that are very similar in size to uh, iron, by the way. Uh, there are chrome and manganese. You have other atoms which have very much larger atomic radii, like molybdenum and they will strain the lattice a lot more, yes? And again, impact uh, many properties of the steel as a consequence. Okay. Uh, so, just the last uh, minutes here, I would like to uh, talk a little bit more about the elements we add to steel. So if you're not familiar with steels uh, much as alloys, um, and um, uh, somebody gives you a steel composition, any steel composition, you will probably wonder why it is that there are so many elements, yes, in that composition, yes, and uh, why their composition is in a particular range, yes. And how is it possible to have one alloy with sometimes 20 elements, yes? For something as simple as, you know, making a beam, yes? It doesn't seem very, it um, doesn't seem to make sense, yes? And um, so first of all, you have to know that uh, certainly if you get a production uh, data, yes, they will uh, analyze very many elements. Yes, even uh, trace elements which are basically impurities, yes? And any material has those, yeah? So, uh, but when it comes to alloying, yes, and the important elements in uh, steel, it is not that uh, steels are alloys of iron with almost every other element in the periodic table. That's not the way, in fact, if you select from the periodic table the elements that are actually uh, important in steel and the ones uh, that, that you will see in, in compositional uh, tables, for instance, these are the elements that are of importance. Yes. And not all of these elements are actually alloying additions. Some of them, such as uh, the elements in yellow now, are basic alloying elements in steel. So those are elements you will almost always see. Yes, they're, they're um, 
we say in English they're conspicuous. That means you know, every steel composition contains manganese you know, or carbon, yes? Uh, well, carbon is essential element. Aluminum, most of the time it's added because we want to desoxidize, kill the steels, but we sometimes we add a lot of it for other reasons, for alloying. The calcium is added because we do the calcium treatments. So there's going to be some uh, uh, manganese, silicon. They come, they basically from the ore. Anytime you make iron, you will also reduce uh, manganese oxides and silicates, and you will have a certain amount, uh, 0.0, 0.0, 0.0, 0.0, 0.0, 0.0, 0.0, 0.0, 0.0, 0.0, 0.0, 0.0, 0.0, 0.0, 0.0, 0.0, 0.0, 0.0, 0.0, 0.0, 